in you know 2010, um, then there are these symptoms that start nagging again. So it's the pain in your ribs on the right side. And you even describing it as, it was like, I couldn't breathe sometimes. Um, and you were in a bigger town, so there was an oncologist. So you did go to that oncologist, right? And then there were scans that were done, um, but it was like, oh, there's nothing on the scans. Their light chains are up a little bit, but nothing, nothing to worry about. And I'd love to hear more about your reaction to that, right? So you are feeling these things, but what you're hearing from the doctor isn't matching up with those, those pains. Yeah, it was really strange because it kind of came on suddenly. And so, um, but I don't know if it did. Now that you, you look back on it, you think, well, maybe there was pain there and I didn't just, I just ignored it. Um, but it just really came on suddenly where I had, um, we were out of town and I had sat, I was sitting on a, just a, a, some steps and I sneezed or coughed or something. I think it was sneezed and just, it just popped in there. And um, I just had so much pain. And that's where we went to an emergency room, everything. Um, I was not, couldn't breathe. I couldn't sit. I couldn't lay without being in excruciating pain. Um, and of course, then I start thinking myeloma um, and we really hadn't, you know, we hadn't seen it for 12 years. And so, um, so they couldn't see anything on the x-rays at the emergency room. Then I went back to the oncologist. And like you said, he didn't see anything. Um, but like the, the light chains test was pretty new back then. And so he hadn't, he didn't have a history of my light chains. So it was difficult for him to say, oh, well, there's a trend, you know, it's, it's going up, it's going up, it's going up. Um, I felt like we needed to do something <laughs> because those light chains were going up. He just felt really confident that there was nothing going on. And um, yeah, so mentally it was just really hard because I, I was like, I think there's something going on. So I just put it to the back of my mind. And then when we finally um, saw a doctor, when we moved to Casper, we moved all over Wyoming, but when we moved to Casper and we saw the doctor here and he found a big, you know, plasma cytoma on those ribs that I'd been. And he's like, well, are you, I've been telling him about other pains. I was having pain in my skull at that time and in my femur and my, um, my hips and um, he did some scans and he's like, well, are you having pain in your, in your ribs on the right side? <laughs> I was like, yeah, for about two years at, at this point. And I said, but I don't, I just don't tell anybody about it anymore because I thought it was nothing. And he's like, well, you have a, a large plasma cytoma on those ribs and it's obviously been growing for, you know, for a long time. And so I don't know what happened with those scans and why they couldn't, you couldn't see it in those, but, um, it's just very, it, it, it was just very strange. And, it, and it, once again, it was one of those things where I wanted to fight for myself and say, Hey, you need to listen to me. I am having these issues and no one's listening to me. Um, you're just kind of blowing it off. And so I've had that experience so many times and I've learned over, you know, 23 years now how to say, wait a minute, I know something is going on. We need to keep investigating this until we figure it out. Wow. I mean, and I, I it's, it just sums it up so much that point of, again, <laughs> the same yeah. message. And let's be real. It is hard sometimes, you know, because you don't want to be that patient, you know, right. right? It, and, and there's something that feels wrong about not fighting back against, but even resisting a little bit, just saying, wait, um, I'm not so, or questioning. I like the word investigate, right? It's not yeah. resistance. It's not, it's being curious. Hey, okay. So I know you say there's nothing on the scan, but look, I'm still feeling X, Y, and Z, uh, but it's tough. We're going against the grain for a lot of the times. I mean, there's some people out there who have no problem speaking up for themselves, but from all the people I've spoken with, I'd say so many more of us are a little bit hesitant about pushing back in that sense. So, right. Yeah, I think um, for me, I'm not a pusher backer. You know, I I want to trust my doctor. I want to do what he says. I want to follow, you know, all of his recommendations. Um, and I'm not one to push back. And it takes me a long time, and it's really hard. And I cry, and I, you know, I get really emotional about it. Um, but I just I just learned how to, you know, have a conversation with the doctor in a way that. And it's taken a long time, you know, um, to, to be able to do this in, in a way where 
I'm just saying, Hey, you know, this is, there's something wrong here and I need you to help me with it. And, um, is there anything else we can do? And my doctor and I, that I have now have really come to that place where we're able to have those conversations really easily. So it's hard. It is hard because you want, you want to trust them and you want to put, you know, your faith in what they have to say, but yet at the same time, you have to advocate for yourself. 100%. And the last thing I'll say about that, and Beth, I think you, you really described it beautifully. You and your doctor now, it's the communication piece, right? Maybe the words we use matter. It's not about resistance or pushback or disagreement, or it's not, it's just, you have your training and your perspective. And I respect that. And not, but, but, and by the way, I am still feeling this and how would they know they, they don't live, you know, in our bodies. So I think your example is great find, you know, that relationship with your doctor where you can have these conversations, not charged with emotion, just very much about what's going on with the body. Um, so thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, I think that'll be very helpful. And so I know that you had the radiation, um, all told that all through until up until last year, you said you had 193 radiation (laughs) sessions. Um, mostly focused on the sternum area, right? Um, And then, so, but with the radiation, is there anything you want to share with people about what helped you with radiation, uh, radiation side effects, especially because you've been through so many sessions? Fortunately with multiple myeloma, but um, they can use low dosages. And so, um, and it's really, really effective. Every time I've had those 193 treatments have all been effective for me. Um, And it, immediately started reducing the pain from the lesions. Um, I, you know, I had several tumors. I've had tumor behind my eye. I've had tumors, um, you know, in my ribs and, um, on my sternum, different places in my skull. Um, and it just reduced them quickly. I only have to have like 12 treatments and, um, then that's all they would do. And so thank goodness the side effects were very minimal. I mean, there's definitely tiredness and fatigue, um, but even redness, um, didn't, you know, I didn't even have like burns or anything. I lost some hair when I had to have some done up here. Um, and then an eyebrow, part of an eyebrow, um, so that caused hair loss a little bit. Um, but mostly I didn't have nausea. I didn't have anything like that. I I think I'm really fortunate because of my age and being young and going through all of that. And I'm still young for being treated for multiple myeloma. And so I think that's an advantage for me in that um, my body handles it pretty well. It's getting harder and harder. You know, I think as it builds up in your system and, and you have so many, but um, but even this last one that I had a year ago, it, it was on my ankle and I didn't have any real side effects except for maybe a little bit of fatigue. So think that's very different from my myeloma patients. You know, I'm in the oncology center with all different kinds of cancers and, you know, and some, some people have a really hard time with radiation. And so, um, they have to, you know, uh, deal with the side effects that I didn't have to deal with. So. Well, I'm glad to hear that you having gone through all that you already had gone through, um, found radiation not to be too bad. Um, like you said, so some fatigue. And so of course you just rested, right? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Um, and you also, I mean, since the relapse have had eight, you said different kinds of chemo, because you had the first one originally, and now you've had eight since. I think, yes. So nine total, I think so. Yeah. Incredible. Um, So I know that at that first time with the relapse, you had the, there was one of the Velcade or Bortezomib, um, Cytoxin and uh, Dexamethasone. And for you, um, before we get into the neuropathy, were there any other side effects that you, you know, even not with just this regimen, but in general, I think just what side effects um, you experience with some of these different chemos and what helped you through them? Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, there's some nausea that happens with it, you know, definitely fatigue. I think for me, that's the biggest side effect of all of the chemos that I've done is fatigue. Um, Also, you know, some nausea, but they're, they're so good now with uh, medications where they have like a three um, medication regimen. So you start with one and if that doesn't help you go to two, and then if that doesn't help you go to three and, um, usually by the second one, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm feeling a lot better. So 
Um, so really that has been really helpful for me as those three medications for nausea. And then they also will give you something um, to help with that. If you're doing an IV treatment that day of, of chemotherapy, they'll start with something that will help with nausea. Um, I've had some other um, side effects like the dexamethasone. Um, I've been on that so long, it's a steroid. And so um, it caused uh, blood clots. So I had a pulmonary embolism, um, actually two clots in my lung um, from that, from being on that long term. And they thought it was in my ankle and they didn't, they did a, a ultrasound. They couldn't find it. And then three days later it was in my lung. So that was definitely a scary side effect of the dexamethasone. The dexamethasone is a hard, um, medication. It causes uh, me to not be able to sleep. And then, so I still do it twice a week. Um, I take it orally and, um, it causes me not to be able to sleep. It causes me to, um, gain weight. It causes me to have, what they call it moon face. Um, it causes, uh, anxiety. So for a while, when I went back on it at high doses, I was on it every time I've done treatment, I've, I've been on dexamethasone and it's been at different dosages. Um, because of some of the things that I've been through, they upped they went back up to a higher dose. It's like the maximum dose that, that they'll give someone um, in a week. But anyway, I would when we started this, I was so angry all the time. And anything my husband said, I would just lose my mind. And, and that's just not me. I'm that's just not my personality. And I would just get angry and I would yell and I would be so mad. Um, and so then we <clears throat> Uh, adjusted it for a little while and then went back up on it. And now I'm doing a lot better. I'm able to um, see it coming a lot better so that I can take the, the steps of, you know, walking away from the situation or, you know, just closing my door for a minute and taking a breath. Um, but the not sleeping part is really difficult. So two nights a week, I, I don't sleep much. Um, the weight gain is really difficult as well. Every time I start it, I gain, you know, anywhere from 10 to 30 pounds. And, um, so that's been really difficult. It's really hard then to lose that weight. My uh, radiation oncologist is always saying, don't worry about it. You, you know, there's nothing you can do. It's chemically changing your, your body. And so, um, just do the best you can eat as healthy as you can. Um, try to stay away from sugars, those kind of things as much as you can. And um, that's all you can really do with, with that dexamethasone, but there's a lot. And it also causes other things, you know, like cataracts um, and there's other drugs um, that I've been on that caused cataracts. Um, um, let's see, just a lot of different, different things with dexamethasone, but, but yeah, I think those are the main um Oh, I know one other thing yeah. there. I just was diagnosed about a year ago with pulmonary hypertension mm -hmm. and they're pretty sure that, so that's basically um, where I get a lot of fluid on my lungs. And so I struggle with shortness of breath and having to use oxygen and that kind of thing. Um, it put me in the ho hospital, they think um, w with pneumonia several times. And um, they think that the, some of the drugs that I've been on have caused that to happen. And so, um, you know, just long-term effects of some of these medications are, are pretty, can be pretty harsh. And so you just have to find, you know, ways of dealing with it right now. I'm on a lot of, um, uh, diuretics to help with the fluid in, in my lungs and then on my body. And, um, that helps with the pulmonary hypertension. So yeah. anyway, so I, there's so many things. <laughs> Yeah. Um, no. And I'm, and I'm hearing from you that like, for instance, with the, with the decks and, you know, the steroids, of course, and people hear about roid rage and all that kind of thing. It's yeah. True though, right. I mean, it's just, there's things yeah. happening in your body uh, you can't control. And so what I'm hearing helped with that was sort of um, because you've been on it for so long, understanding, uh, okay, I'm feeling like this is about to happen. Um, could you then ask your doctor to lower the dosage essentially for like temporarily? Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah, definitely. And that's what we did. We just temporarily, and then when we went back up again, it was fine and I was able to, to deal with it. So mm -hmm. right now I'm, I'm handling it really well at, at um, the maximum dose. 
Um, so I just think I've just learned, unfortunately, <laughs> it had to take it for so long. I've learned how to deal with it. So, yeah, no, but thank you for sharing that and what helped, um, because I think people are always looking for some ideas, you know, um, and part of it is this acceptance that these things are going to happen and yeah. that it's okay. Um, mm -hmm. and whatever you need to do to get through it, you, you do. Right. Um, yeah. Although I know much easier to say than to do. Um, so I'm going to bring up a photo too, because you were talking about a tumor behind your left eye. And I mean, this was going on um, just in the last couple of years, you know, that this, I think, sums up sort of your life experience the last, well, I don't know, like many, many years, right? So um, yeah, describe sort of how it was living through all these different, you know, and this sort of um, need to be in tune with your body as much as possible. Yeah, so talking about that one um, with the tumor in my uh, orbital bone, um, you can see in that picture is that um, my eye was starting to droop. My left eye, which is the one closest to my son's act there, um, was starting to droop down. It was starting to close and, and kind of move down my face in a way. And if you saw the uh, MRI scans, you would see that there was a tumor on my orbital bone and it was pushing into my brain a little bit and it was pushing my, my eyeball down my face. And so I went like, I had no idea in this picture. I had no idea that this was happening to me. Um, I just kept looking at myself in the mirror going, that eye looks really droopy. And, um, I would ask people sometimes like my husband, I'm like, does that eye look droopy? And he's like, Oh, I don't know. Maybe. Um, I just thought maybe it's just something that I was, it was happening to me as I got older. I was not sure. And then one day I was at oncology and I asked one of the nurses, I said, look at my face and <laughs> tell me if you think my eye is drooping. And one of the nurses like, yes, I can totally see it. And so I went in and saw um, our PA there and she's like, we need to go get an MRI right now. And uh, that's when they found that uh, tumor there. But this is very typical of how my life goes, where I have, some, you know, I, I'm sure I had some bone pain there for a while. Um, you know, I have bone pain in my ribs and I think to myself, is it old? Is it new? You know, what is happening in these places? Um, you know, it, is it nothing? Is it mus muscular? Is it bone pain? Um, so this is, you know, and a lot of it too is because I don't show the M protein. So the only way that they really see my, my, the progression of my disease is through pain and it's through, um, the light chain test. If my light chains just barely go up, you know, people live in the hundreds in their light chains. I, if I go up to seven, I know I'm going to start getting lesions somewhere. And so that helps a little bit because then I can look at that and go, Oh, if you know, if I'm at 10, then I know that, Oh, this pain could be a lesion somewhere, you know, in my shoulder or in my arm and my leg, whatever. And so it's just, um, it's just a constant everyday thing where, you know, I'm guessing about, you know, how I'm feeling, what's hurting. Um, you know, I went for a long time thinking my ankle was just twisted or hurt and I was hobbling around and I was limping and, um, and finally my doctors are like, well, we need to do something about this. We need to look and take a scan of it. And sure enough, you know, there's a tumor in my ankle and, um, you know, I had to end up wearing a boot for a while and, uh, they did radiation on it. And so it's just how my life goes all the time. It's just those kind of things. And, and, and Beth, I, you know, the way you sum it up and describe it is that's just the way my life goes with these things, you know? So it's been so many years of you, of you dealing with this. Um, but my last question about this before we, we move on, because I know you were then labeled with triple class refractory disease, um, and then had to, you know, go on to try different things. Um, but you know, you, you're trying so many different treatments, nothing's really working and it's almost like a whack-a-mole, right? And you do this, but then this pops yep. over here. Um, you know, I think that's a very shared experience with a lot of people who are diagnosed with multiple myeloma. So is there anything that, anything else you want to share um, other than, you know, you just sort of kept marching on? I know your faith helped, but any other thing you want to say, like, you know, did it help to, for instance, draw boundaries with people? Like, 
you don't want to talk about it all the time. So you, you know what I mean? Like, were there Mm -hmm. things about living actual day-to-day life that helped you so that you didn't feel like I'm Beth with multiple, multiple myeloma. I'm just Beth. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, that's probably one of my biggest struggles is how to live your life like that, because I'm sick a lot. And, um, you know, the last year has been really hard and I, you know, I was in like, when I go to oncology, they push me around in a wheelchair or, you know, I was walking around my house with oxygen on because I wasn't able to breathe or, you know, hobbling around in a boot because my ankle was, had a tumor in it, you know, all these things. And so how do I, how do I be just Beth? And it's really hard. Um, you know, I, I guess the biggest thing for me is if I'm going to go through this, I want to help others who have to go through it. And so doing things like this or at the oncology center, um, you know, there's, we have a couple of myeloma patients there, but there's not a lot, but you, it doesn't matter. There's other people with cancer that I can, you know, talk with and, and let them share their story with me. Um, and so being Beth with myeloma isn't so bad all the time. I want to help other people and be a part of their journey and just be there to listen to them. Um, so I don't know, it's, it's, it's a really, really difficult thing to, to manage. Um, so I just live with it. I, I guess I just live in it. Um, being Beth with myeloma. And I mean, when I was working as a teacher, um, there at the end, it was just really hard because I was needing accommodations. You know, I needed people to help me get my kids to other classes. I needed, um, you know, my oxygen in my classroom. I needed all these things. And so I just became Beth, you know, with cancer and I guess it's okay. I don't, I don't mind it too much. Um, you know, if people want to talk about it, I'm always willing to talk about it and share my story and see if I can encourage anyone. Um, So that's kind of where I'm at after 23 years. Thank you, you know, and and because of your heart and and your experience and everything that's led you to this moment, I really appreciate that you shared your story with so many different people, including with the patient story, because this really is what a lot of people are seeking is that connection. So they don't feel so alone, like, oh, okay, she went through that. me too, and I'm not the only one. So it's it's so powerful. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna stop, and um, the next segment will be about these newer treatments um, that you tried, some that didn't work, and one that really did. 